Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Warren Hogue, IPI's Senior Advisor for External Relations. I'm standing in momentarily for our President, Terry Road Larson, who was called to the UN because of the ongoing debate over the application for Palestinian statehood that has been delivered to Secretary General Ban Ki-moon today, and indeed Mahmoud Abbas is just finishing or just has finished his address to the General Assembly right now. So I suspect Terry will come back and join us uh, midway. But in his behalf, let me say IPI welcomes you and thanks you for coming here today during this very busy week, not to mention today's lousy weather. It's my pleasure today to introduce Lamberto Zanier, Secretary General of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, commonly referred to as the OSCE. Ambas Ambassador Zanier took up his post only this July 1st, but he's no newcomer to the OSCE since he was the director of the OSCE's Conflict Prevention Center from 2002 to 2006. Prior to taking up his current position, he was head of the United Nations Interim Administration Mission in Kosovo, or UNMIC. The 56-nation, three-continent OSCE is a regional arrangement of the United Nations under Chapter 8 of the Charter and specializes in conflict prevention, particularly in the post-Soviet space and the Balkans. Its secretariat in Vienna is located just five minutes from IPI's Vienna office. IPI has a close relationship with the OSCE. This year, the Institute is supporting Lithuanians' chairmanship of the organization, particularly following up from the Astana Summit in December last year, which provided a new perspective for the pan-European organization. So, Mr. Secretary General, thank you for coming, and we look forward to your remarks. Thank you very much, uh, for your nice uh, introductory uh, words, Warren. And I'm um, very happy to be here today. Uh, I would like to thank IPI and uh, through you, Warner, uh, President uh, Terry Lord Larson, uh, for uh, the kind invitation, the opportunities given to me today, and, uh, uh, and also the very good uh, cooperation that we have established with, uh, with IPI. I thought uh, uh, that the support that uh, IPI has given uh, to the Lithuanian chairmanship this year has been instrumental in uh, uh, helping the organization uh, move ahead in its own internal reflection and uh, contributing, it seems to me, uh, in a, in a very good way to preparing some of the ministerial decisions that we expect uh, to be able to adopt in, uh, uh, at the ministerial meeting in, uh, in uh, Vilnius in December. Uh, so I would like today to um, touch on uh, two, three general issues and uh, uh, trying to, to put them in context of the evolution of the European security, where, where the OSCE is today, uh, why uh, is it still a relevant player? What are the things we are doing? And what are the key challenges in front of us? So what is, uh, how do we position ourselves uh, in the light of the evolving security uh, uh, challenges? Um, uh, let me start by referring to a concept that emerged from the Astana summit we had uh, last December, uh, uh, this gathering of heads of state and government that um, agreed on a number, I think, of important uh, concepts. One of them, uh, a vision of the OSC as a security community. And uh, in fact, I will quote the, the language agreed by them, which is a vision of a free, democratic, common, and in indivisible Euro-Atlantic and Eurasian security community stretching from Vancouver to Vla Vladivostok, rooted in agreed principles, shared commitments, and common goals. And this short, uh, this short uh, sentence epitomizes a number of, uh, of important uh, elements and principles for the OSC to operate. First of all, what, I what is a security community itself? Uh, it's a recognition that the states uh, uh, cannot be secure at the expense of others in the community. Uh, it, mean it means uh, uh, common principles, common norms on behavior, sh shared values, what Helsinki stood for, which uh, remains uh, if you want the core uh, still set of values, principles uh, on which the, the, the organization operates. 
And uh, I think it should be looked in, in two different ways. One, uh, what the community does for itself. Uh, uh, the community that uh, uh, has developed a number of tools to address uh, internal problems, uh, to address the unresolved conflicts, uh, the problems uh, related to transition, uh, uh, to address uh, the problem of uh, perceived uh, or existing security imbalances. Uh, the other is, uh, which has developed over time, is uh, a community of uh, states that have come together to see uh, to, to uh, see how they can best react in addressing external challenges in a, in an increasingly uh, globalized world where world where um, uh, there is a need for uh, a, a common policy uh, towards uh, these new. Um, uh, interconnection security uh, problems that emerge from uh, uh, from outside, uh, looking at terrorism, looking at uh, border issues, etc., and, and having to develop new tools. Now, why the OSCE, and uh, and what has the OSCE to offer? One of the issues uh, sometimes uh, uh, I come across in terms of questions that are asked to me when I uh, meet with groups of uh, students, for instance, is. Why do we need the OSCE? We have the European Union, we have NATO. What, what is the difference today? And uh, the difference uh, is, is quite visible, if you, if you think well. Uh, the EU is, uh, is uh, um, a group of countries that do share a very strong political agenda, a very strong integration agenda, uh, uh, that come together and that want to move in the same direction. Uh, NATO, in a similar way, uh, uh, brings together countries that share uh, a vision and an agenda uh, at the defense level. Uh, but the OSCE is broader than all that. The, in the OSCE, you have countries that have uh, different uh, uh, political priorities, different security or defense agendas. Uh, it, is a, it is a larger framework within which countries, in fact, with different objectives and different agendas, confront uh, each other and try uh, to, to solve their problems by using this agreed set of uh, uh, principles, norms, and, and commitments. Um, so it is, it is comprehensive. Uh, it addresses this, la this large community. And because, it, uh, because the community is large, it encompasses different uh, dimensions. There's a Euro-Atlantic dimension. There's a, a, a Eurasian dimension. And there's even now a, um, an increasing attention to a Mediterranean uh, uh, perspective. And, uh, and there, there are discussions, and I'll refer to that in a minute, on what the OSCE can do. Uh, in relation to developments in that in that areas on the borders of the uh, of the OSC region, uh, the OSC approach to security is is a comprehensive approach, as you will know, that uh, stretches across uh, uh, thematic dimensions, so the, the, the traditional uh, uh, politico military uh, uh, dimension of security, uh, the economic and environmental one, and the and the human security. And uh, uh, the, the approach is, uh, is an approach that is yeah, uh, basically intergovernmental, because it's an organization within which there is an, interna an interaction between governments that look at their own uh, security issues, their own priorities, etc. But because of this broad agenda, the OSC is also looking at other levels. It's looking at the security uh, of the individual, at the dignity of the individual, and the fundamental freedoms. Uh, working with individuals improves security within countries and, and more broadly. And then it's looking also at the other uh, end of the spectrum, if you want, at the regional level and the interaction uh, uh, between the various actors within, uh, uh, within the region and uh, with, with the external partners. Um, uh, the, 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 um, uh, uh, at the center of this uh, uh, process of, of uh, um, uh, of uh, um, uh, uh, looking at responses to the security concerns, there is a continuing process of dialogue. Uh, the dialogue is, uh, I think, a key engine, if you want, uh, for the for the OSCE. It is uh, it is the tool through which uh, uh, the organisation gets uh, a sense of. Uh, what are the issues that are really important for the countries? What are, where are the priorities? What are the issues where we need, uh, we need to focus? It's important because it provides uh, uh, early warning to the organization 
and uh, it has been the basis for the organization then to uh, develop tools to respond uh, to these uh, to these early signals early signals of warning uh, in, a, in a mode that is very much oriented towards uh, the, the towards conflict prevention in uh, in uh, my practical activities I started very early as you uh, very uh, recently as you pointed out um, I've seen already how the organization uh, works in these uh, in these areas I've been involved in uh, uh, opening the new session of the so-called Forum for Security Cooperation, which is uh, one of the traditional Paul Mill fora within the OSCE, uh, which is a forum led in this period by, by Kazakhstan. And there was the uh, Minister of Defense of Kazakhstan present. Uh, uh, there was the director of the UN uh, office in Geneva who attended, uh, bringing in a bit the, the, the UN side of, uh, of security and helping us link uh, with the United Nations in our um, uh, in our planning for uh, for um, uh, a program on enhancing uh, our own uh, our own political military uh, security tools, uh, I was in Prague to open the Economic Forum. There is a big discuss discussion there on uh, energy security. It's one of the uh, issues that now feature prominently on the agenda of many of our uh, countries in Europe, and where uh, there is a discussion about establishing a task force. Uh, that will uh, focus on the set of issues that the OSC can best uh, uh, deal with in uh, in um, moving forward on uh, uh, on this set of uh, on this set of questions. Uh, I, I will going I will be going as soon as I go back to uh, to Vienna. I will be going um, uh, immediately to Warsaw to open uh, the uh, Human Dimensional Implementation Meeting, uh, which will be uh, the opportunity for us uh, to look at the state of. Uh, implementation of commitments in the uh, in the human dimension but they also had interaction with the partners within the organization discussing a little bit uh, their own priorities their own vision of the organization but also with external partners i was uh, i was in egypt i met with the uh, new secretary general of the arab league and i found him very interested in developing uh, relations with the osce uh, in, a, in a very pragmatic manner, uh, developing also MOUs and trying to, to uh, structure them uh, uh, at, at the institutional level, but then looking at how we can interact on the ground. The OSC has developed uh, uh, quite an experience in, uh, in transition, in assisting in, in phases of transition in Europe, in Central Asia, in very, diff very different environment. And uh, every, every transition, is, uh, transition process is different. Uh, but a number of valuable lessons have been learned in this, in this process. And these kind of lessons can be shared with the countries that go through similar processes. And uh, in areas adjacent to uh, the OSC, uh, uh, the OSC uh, area, it is, uh, um, uh, it is even more relevant. Uh, so th there's something there that can be offered. But the OSC also offers itself a model for other organizations. The Arab League, for instance, seems to be looking for a more operational role for itself. Uh, so it's, uh, it is also looking at how we in, in the OSC uh, have gone about these problems, uh, what tools we have developed, what tools could be replicated by other international organizations. So it becomes also a little bit of a model on uh, how we operated in our own environment uh, for other regional arrangements than to, uh, uh, to consider uh, adjusting to their own uh, their own situation and to uh, potentially uh, replicate in in certain uh, in certain areas. Um, conflict prevention is very much uh, at the center of the activities of the organization. The organization has uh, has evolved a lot uh, from the time of uh, of Helsinki. We come from a uh, from a phase in which uh, the Cold War uh, security was a zero sum game. And uh, um, uh, and, this, and the, the participating states were really uh, um, uh, having a very uh, how can I say an approach based on uh, on security gains which would correspond to security losses from the other side, and we moved from that uh, that situation uh, to one uh, where we had to deal with with the transition and we had to develop a number of new tools. That's the phase in which we created the institutions. Uh, uh, where we created the Secretariat, the Conflict Prevention Center, ODIR, the Representative of Freedom of the Media, uh, uh, the High Commissioner for National Minorities, uh, creating tools to help countries uh, implement those uh, basic norms, principles, and commitments that they had agreed upon in Helsinki. In a phase of transition, 
uh, where the OSC had also to learn how to deal with situations uh, uh, where we had to operate within failed states or, uh, or uh, uh, deal with uh, conflicts that uh, uh, arose as a uh, consequence of uh, the disaggregation of uh, larger entities like, such, such as the, the, the Soviet Union or uh, the former Yugoslavia. And then a third phase started, and uh, we, we can say after the 11th of, uh, of September uh, 2001, uh, when, when we started looking at the more global challenges, and uh, terrorism being, uh, being the first, and then, and then uh, uh, looking at the um, uh, um, uh, at issues like such as trafficking, trafficking human beings, uh, drugs, uh, the security of borders, uh, uh, and, and developing new tools to, uh, to address these issues. This changed also the mode of operation within the organization because we uh, moved from a situation where there was an, a, a, a continuing uh, confrontation between the various players to a situation where the, 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 the various players realized that security was no longer necessarily a zero-sum game. Uh, when uh, developing tools uh, to address uh, terrorism, for instance, across the OSC area, um, through a shared vision of what needs to be done through assisting developing legislation, developing capacities, etc., would in fact increase the security of everybody. And uh, that also created a new dynamic within the organization uh, uh, that was superimposed, if you want, uh, on, on, what existed, uh, on what existed earlier. And, uh, uh, and this has expanded a lot the agenda of the organization uh, uh, to the point that one of the problems we face now is really trying to regroup on some of the core issues uh, and avoid that the agenda becomes too much a, a pick and choose one, if I can, if I can be a bit uh, uh, critical of some of, uh, some of the things I'm, I'm seeing uh, from, my, from my perspective. Um, Working on conflict prevention uh, has a cost. Uh, I saw that also when I was in the, in the conflict prevention center. The cost for that uh, is the visibility of the organization. Uh, um, uh, operating in conflict prevention uh, requires very often a very low-key approach. Um, uh, it doesn't require resources, but requires a lot of patience, and it is very difficult to market the results. It is very difficult even to uh, recognize the results of it. Uh, uh, there are a number of uh, very interesting operations that the OSC has conducted. I could uh, think of one, and I see some colleagues, some foreign colleagues in the OSC that were involved in some of, in some of these uh, 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 these operations. In, uh, for instance, in the Caucasus, when we had a uh, border monitoring operation between uh, uh, the Chechen segment, the segment of the Russian border and the Georgian border, and, uh, um, and we were monitoring the movement of, uh, of uh, potential Chechen rebels uh, across the border at the time when uh, Georgia and Russia were accusing each other uh, in, the, in that regard, and, uh, and we could really play a, a role of mediation that helped really lower the temperature and diffuse a crisis that most likely would have, uh, would have taken place. Of course, it is very difficult to argue uh, uh, after the fact that uh, there would have been a crisis had we not been there <laughs> and that we had a key role in, uh, in, in diffusing it, but that's, that's the, the nature uh, the nature of the game, and it is important. I was yesterday at a meeting uh, of the Security Council where uh, there was a discussion about the need of uh, using more the tools of preventing uh, of preventive diplomacy because it is cheaper and uh, obviously it saves lives whenever, whenever this succeeds. And it is an area where a closer interaction between the various actors is, uh, is essential. Uh, the UN and regional organizations, re regional organizations among, uh, uh, among themselves. Um, so uh, the, the, the advantage of focusing on conflict prevention is that uh, you don't need many resources. And uh, the OSCE is a cheap organization. Uh, before the OSCE, I was in Kosovo uh, leading a, a UN operation there. When, when I started in 2008, my budget for that, uh, for that operation in Kosovo was higher than the entire budget of the OSCE today. And if you, if you think the budget of the OSC today covers the Secretariat, the institutions I mentioned earlier, 17 field operations, some of them, the one in Kosovo is larger than the UN mission I left uh, when, I, when I left Kosovo. 
so th th there is an impressive difference in a way. Uh, investing in conflict prevention, when one says, yeah, one ounce of prevention is, uh, 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 saves you, a, 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 what is it, a pound in, in, uh, in crisis management, it's even more than that, probably, as we see on some of the, of the complicated conflicts. But, but certainly, it is, uh, uh, it is a good area for the international community to invest in. Uh, um, and uh, it is an area where we need to look at each other's experiences and, and see how we can maximize the results of, uh, of uh, uh, preventive diplomacy and conflict prevention uh, activities. Um, it is an area where I myself, coming now from the UN, uh, I intend to engage personally. And this brings us back to what I was saying earlier also about uh, sharing uh, lessons, so sharing not only the tools, but also the lessons with, uh, uh, with other parts of the world. Uh, I found uh, rather prominent on the agenda of the, of the organization discussion on both on Afghanistan and on North Africa. Uh, on Afghanistan, the OSC has been involved in the past. Uh, the, there's been a bit of election observation. Uh, there is a quite uh, active role of um, quite an uh, active um, uh, function of uh, uh, training uh, of customs officers. We have a, a border management college in uh, Dushanbe in Tajikistan. Uh, which is used to train uh, Tajik uh, border guards, but also operates regionally and also involves uh, uh, Afghan uh, personnel. We train more than 100 uh, Afghan border guards. And we are now restructuring uh, and strengthening this, uh, this function. But we are also looking at, uh, at the regional dynamics. And uh, we intend to take full part in the, the political processes, the Istanbul conference, the Bonn conference coming up towards the end of the year, to see how uh, can we better plug into the larger effort by the international community, uh, how we can strengthen the role of uh, the part of the region that is part of the OSC area, uh, so the Central Asian countries in, in, in that. Uh, looking at how we can also play to strengthen and to, to contribute to uh, initiatives such as the, uh, the Silk Road uh, uh, initiative, uh, uh, looking uh, at uh, economic development in the area and contributing, contributing to that. Uh, so there uh, already we, we are monitoring, observing and uh, developing uh, a number of tools uh, to, uh, uh, to give our own contribution. Um, in North Africa, uh, where we see this uh, process of transition uh, beginning, uh, we have certainly an accumulated expertise. Uh, and uh, most of the countries there are partners of the OSC, so we have a direct dialogue with them. And in the context of this dialogue, uh, we discuss uh, uh, possible areas for us to cooperate with them. Of course, they are not full member states, uh, so we cannot do that on the basis of the agreed uh, uh, concepts uh, and, uh, and uh, principles of the OSC. Uh, but certainly the partnerships, uh, the partnership has a meaning in itself. These countries are interested in what we are doing, uh, are observing closely uh, uh, how the OSC operated uh, in, in uh, dealing with transition within the OSC area. They are interested in seeing what are the lessons learned, what are the best practices, uh, but also what capacity we, we have in terms of assisting them, capacity building. Uh, we have, uh, for instance, started training some uh, Egyptian NGOs in, uh, in election monitoring. And we think that this could be beneficial uh, for the uh, um, processes that are, that are coming up in Egypt. A parliamentary assembly uh, is uh, sending a team of parliamentary observers to Tunisia, a team headed by an Italian parliamentarian. Uh, uh, who is the vice president of the assembly um, uh, to, to monitor elections there as a contribution also to these, uh, to these processes. So there are now a number of areas where we can, uh, we can contribute and perhaps also there uh, we should move uh, in a direction that also creates a, a, a better framework and a more agreed framework for us, for us to intervene. There are some uh, who really encourage us to think in terms of uh, looking at the Mediterranean dimension of the OSC, which is a dimension that goes back to the uh, Helsinki Charter, uh, uh, in terms of a, uh, of a possible subset uh, of, uh, of uh, norms or, or a framework within which we can operate that could be closely attached to the OSC and, uh, and could serve as a vehicle also to propagate some of the 
uh, of the ACI of the OSCE also throughout this area, uh, recognizing a principle that once again was uh, discussed and agreed in Astana, which is a principle of, uh, uh, of uh, um, uh, security in, the, in Northern Africa being inextricably linked, as the uh, heads of state put it, with the security of Europe. So uh, as uh, we continue to operate as a regional organization, adapting ourselves, developing new tools, uh, we are also looking at how to uh, develop our own relationship with the uh, external side of the organization, because we do perceive that the challenges and the security problems in the area outside the organization can, uh, can affect also the security of our own member states. So this, this is the new, if you want, the new horizons that are, uh, that are opening up. And, and some of the, uh, the um, uh, um, themes that will be discussed uh, at our ministerial uh, meeting in Vilnius at the end of the year. Okay, this in terms of uh, uh, general introduction, and then perhaps we can discuss uh, some of the points. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, that was a broad and comprehensive look at an extraordinarily broad and comprehensive set of uh, concerns and interests, and, and a budget that is not as broad as, uh, as the agenda is, as you pointed out. Um, I think I'm going to invite you to come sit here, yep. and uh, we're going to open it up to questions, but I have a few questions of my own beforehand. One of them, you mentioned uh, sort of early on Nagorno-Karabakh, and that puts me in mind of Transnistria. And since my background is being a daily journalist, I like to ask you about things that are happening right now. And there was a meeting yesterday in Moscow, uh, the so-called, um, or it was a meeting about the so-called five plus two talks. And interestingly, one of the five is the OSCE, otherwise it is countries and territories, and the two is the EU and the US. But I want to ask you uh, what the outcome of that meeting was. This is a meeting aimed at, uh, at resuming the 5.2 talks. Did it succeed, and can this advance the cause of settlement in that area? Uh, this, this was a, a relatively recent breakthrough we saw. Uh, there was a meeting uh, on confidence-building measures on Transnistria in Germany, in Bad Reichenhall, uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, uh, that meeting created an opportunity for a direct engagement uh, uh, between the, um, uh, uh, the Moldovan Prime Minister and the Transnistrian President, uh, Smirnov. And uh, uh, the, the result of that was an agreement uh, to meet in Moscow to discuss the way forward on the negotiation. Uh, um, the role of, uh, of uh, some of the players there, the, the, uh, our chairmanship and the head of our mission for the OSC, but also the Russians and the Germans, were, was, was very important. Uh, and uh, as a result, uh, uh, this meeting took place informally, in, uh, uh, but in this format, in, uh, uh, in Moscow on the 22nd. And, uh, and the agreement is that the, ne the negotiations will resume. That in itself is a very important uh, uh, political indication as well, because these negotiations were suspended since 2006, I think. Uh, so it is a resumption of, uh, of a process that, uh, that was in itself frozen. Uh, there are some uh, very concrete issues on the agenda on which progress, uh, uh, if there is the political will, uh, could, could take place, and, uh, and that would be a basis for movement towards uh, a, 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 a resolution of the issue over time. So I think uh, that's good news. What we have seen uh, is, is positive, and there is hope that we are, uh, we are seeing uh, uh, real progress towards solving one of uh, the protracted conflicts within the OSCE. Thank you. Um, Secretary General, you mentioned, I mentioned in my introduction, and you mentioned in your talk, uh, your time in Kosovo. Um, obviously, that's a situation we pay a lot of attention to here in the UN community. Can you tell us a bit about how you see the situation in Kosovo now, how it be, will evolve the next few years, and, and also what the UN's <laughs> continuing role there will be? In Kosovo? Yes. Um,
the 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 Kosovo issue is uh, uh, is first of all a political one. Uh, it's a matter of uh, uh, of recognition of Kosovo as member of the international community or lack thereof. Uh, uh, Kosovo has been recognized by an increasingly large number of uh, member states of the United Nations, but still it's not recognized by Serbia uh, uh, and, uh, and by a number of other uh, important uh, members of the Security Council and of the international community. So the, the international community is still divided. Now, what is really significant in this is the lack of understanding between Kosovo and Serbia on, uh, on some very fundamental issues revolving around the, the status of Kosovo. So what is needed is, uh, is uh, uh, an understanding on this point and an understanding between Kosovo and Serbia, which will then allow also the international community to, uh, to move on on the, on the Kosovo issue. Uh, uh, this process of, uh, of uh, dialogue is, uh, is continuing uh, through, uh, um, through a negotiation that is now um, uh, uh, mediated uh, by the European Union. Uh, I think it has to be the European Union uh, uh, that performs that role because the European perspective for Serbia and over time for Kosovo uh, is key in this uh, in this process, uh, but in the in the meantime, uh, uh, this is not something that Europeans can do alone. There is a need for a larger presence. There is a need for a presence of the United Nations because Resolution 1244 is fully valid, and uh, uh, and uh, uh, the presence of a UN mission uh, um, uh, guarantees. Uh, 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 the the uh, uh, continued implementation of uh, the um, uh, of the resolution as agreed by the Security Council. So until that changes, uh, the UN must must remain involved to uh, guarantee a status of international legality. And uh, and the OSC is uh, is operating under the fold of uh, of this resolution still as a pillar of. Uh, of the UN, looking at very concrete uh, issues on the ground, uh, looking at uh, uh, the, the needs of the communities and, uh, and working with the people to avoid, uh, uh, to avoid uh, that any crisis takes uh, uh, large proportions. Uh, uh, what we are seeing in the North now is a very specific uh, uh, subset of problems, uh, and that's really related uh, to uh, um, uh, uh, the the uh, effort by the Kosovo the Kosovo Albanian institutions to reach out uh, in an area which is predominant, predominantly Serb dominated and there is resistance to that uh, and the way forward is obviously through dialogue and negotiation not through force but unfortunately uh, there is a mix of the two and every time force is applied the reactions are violent and this uh, and this tends to provoke crisis. Does something like the recent arrest of Ratko Mladic have an effect on that process? Indirectly, yes, uh, in the sense that it uh, um, helps Serbia move uh, closer to the European Union and uh, and uh, uh, the more obstacles are removed on the path of Serbia towards the European Union the better chance I think the international community and the Europeans have also to make progress on the on the Kosovo issue. Well, I'd like to turn this over to questions from the floor. Uh, I want to tell you in advance, uh, uh, we are streaming this today live. And so when you uh, raise your hand, and I call on you, uh, when the microphone gets to you, remember you've got to hold that microphone very steady because that is the sound that's going out on the streaming. Uh, we sometimes have had cases here where people get exuberant and start to gesticulate with the hand that's holding the microphone, and that's the end of the sound system. Uh, so uh, please raise your hand, and I will call on you. And we'll, we'll start with Jerk, okay? Just Dirk Solomons, please identify yourself. Uh, Dirk Solomons, Columbia University. I wonder whether the OECE actually acts as the conscience of its member states. Not all members of the OECE take human rights, uh, uh, press freedom, uh, human security equally serious. Thinking of Russia, for example, where you may ask, are they always living up to Helsinki standards? 
Now, I wonder whether OECE sees it as its task to either quietly or even more publicly raise eyebrows when uh, behavior of some of its member states crosses the Helsinki lines. I think I'll let you answer that now. Okay? Yes, well, you could, you could portray it like that. At the end of the day, uh, the member states are the ones who develop these principles, these norms, uh, these uh, um, uh, uh, benchmarks, if you want. And, uh, and it's up to them also to define uh, uh, their, their own behavior. And that's why there is this dialogue within the organization. And it gets pretty lively at times. On, uh, uh, including on issues uh, on issues of this uh, of this nature, so it is part of the process. Uh, and uh, now there is a big discussion, as you may have uh, seen, on the on the observation of the elections in Russia. That's also part of that uh, part of that process. Uh, um, the fact that uh, uh, those commitments are there uh, gives an opportunity, gives leverage to the international community or to that part of the international and the regional community that wants to see progress in that area uh, uh, to, to push for more. And, uh, and the notion is a bit the, uh, um, uh, that we mentioned earlier, that security goes beyond uh, you know, arms control or hard security. Uh, uh, it, it, it really, human security is very much part of that. And so there is a widespread perception within the organization that the way one uh, country deals with uh, uh, human rights and fundamental freedoms uh, within its own fold does have repercussion uh, externally also on the others. And uh, uh, so that's, that's part of the internal dynamics of the organization. But because the organization has also links with the civil society, this also creates uh, repercussions outside uh, the, the intergovernmental uh, process, uh, which is positive and uh, something I uh, I've said myself after uh, taking office is that we need to relink better to the civil society. We need the support of the civil society for for uh, uh, for the activities we we carry out, and it is it is good to have a how can I say a group of friends outside that uh, that assist us and encourage us. But one has also to take into account the need not to be over selective. Uh, the, the agenda of the organization and the approach to security is, is a very comprehensive one, as, as, I, uh, as I pointed out earlier. Uh, so human rights is one part of the equation, and uh, you need to look at all, at all aspects of that. Thank you, Pim Miller from IPI. Um, you mentioned at the outset of your presentation that you've struck up a dialogue with the new Secretary General of the Arab League, uh, El Arabi, uh, on whether uh, the OSCE offers a model for the Arab nations in terms of um, security, and security cooperation and conflict prevention. Um, my question would be, do you sense that there's a greater uh, appetite among Arab nations right now in the wake of the Arab Spring for such a, uh, a new regional security uh, cooperation mechanism in the region? Um, and my second question would be, um, there are elections coming up in Kyrgyzstan uh, on the 30th of October. And we heard uh, latest this morning from the foreign minister of Kazakhstan uh, that they are starting to prepare for uh, what that could mean in terms of inter-ethnic uh, violence or election-related uh, violence. I'd like to know what the OSCE is doing on that front. Thank you. Well, uh, on the first point, I, I found Al Arabi very interested in, uh, in looking at how we operate and, uh, and some of our procedures and, and also at establishing closer links with us, as I said. Uh, I really don't want to comment on, on issues that really are relevant, uh, are not directly relevant for my organization. But my, my feeling is that there are different views uh, in the Arab world on uh, uh, what the role could be for their own regional, uh, regional setups. But what I, what I saw is that uh, El Arabi seemed to have the ambition of wanting to strengthen the role of the Arab League. Uh, whether he's getting enough backing from his own constituency on that, it's really his issue, and I wouldn't want to, to comment on that. But, uh, but uh, as I say, uh, he seems to be, uh, uh, to be ambitious and to, to want to do more and to want to have more tools uh, to intervene in a cooperative way, looking a little bit at the OSC, how the OSC does it its own way in its own area. 
On, uh, on uh, Kyrgyzstan, uh, yes, I met with President Tumbayev yesterday. I will be traveling to Kyrgyzstan uh, in a couple of weeks' time before the elections uh, uh, to look at the situation. I think it's important also for, for in the international community to pass clear messages uh, in, in, in this phase. It is an important uh, phase of transition for, uh, for King, Kyrgyzstan. It's important they get it right and they make an effort to do that. Uh, I was very encouraged, <coughs> sorry, from what I heard from uh, uh, from the president. Um, but I, uh, I have to say that we need really to stay very committed. Uh, it is important that we have uh, uh, a good observation of the election, that we give a sense that the international community is there and is really helping and, and uh, assisting in this process. Uh, but we need also to work uh, with the security structures. Uh, we have in the OSC, we have a pretty large program, which is called the Community Security Initiative, uh, a, problem of, a program of uh, uh, training, but more importantly, mentoring uh, uh, the, the police uh, in, in its own activities. Uh, because the way the police uh, acts or reacts, especially with the minority communities, may, may be uh, critical uh, uh, in terms of... Uh, uh, maintaining a, a degree of stability uh, in a phase, uh, as, as we all know, phases of tra transition are always the most uh, sensitive, uh, delicate ones. Uh, so that's where we need to be prepared and we need to be ready uh, to, to give a hand. Um, Secretary General, you mentioned in your comment you were contrasting the OSCE with uh, NATO and the EU, and your point was that NATO and the EU, the EU is, a, is uh, they have shared visions, they're communities of, of uh, a certain sameness, uh, and that you, 56 countries, three continents, uh, had widely varying priorities within your mix, and yet I think I understand correctly you reached decision by consensus, yes? I guess my question is, uh, sometimes that kind of diversity can lead to gridlock as easily as it can lead to big decision. How do you avoid that? Yeah, there, there has been a debate, and it's a debate that comes and goes within the OSC around the, the issue of consensus. Um, uh, you know, s some of the big players do have influence. And I, if, if you mention the EU, for instance, I consider the EU as, as a player in the organization at this point. And, uh, 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 but, but the USC is more than just, you know, uh, the US, uh, the EU, uh, uh, Russia, Turkey. It's also a large number of countries that have uh, maybe association agreements with one or the other that uh, uh, are part of other structures, whether it's NATO, whether it's uh, CIS or the CSTO, etc. But that have uh, uh, very strong uh, national agendas and that struggle to find a forum where they can uh, uh, really uh, make their voice heard in the same way as they can uh, in the OSC. Uh, because, say, with the EU, they are external partners and they have a, a different kind of relationship. In the OSC, with the rule of consensus, they can block a decision because the decision is affecting something that they consider as a, an important security concern for them. And uh, in a sense, this is important. It, uh, first of all, it gives a sense of empowerment to, to everybody. It's, uh, uh, it's not the organization of a group of countries, it's an organization of each of its members. And, uh, uh, and uh, uh, this encourages them to participate more, uh, to be more active, but also to make use of, uh, of the organization. If you, get, if you get rid of the consensus rule or limit it somehow, uh, at the end of the day, the ones who might lose are the smaller countries. Mm. Uh, so in a way, I, I do think that even though this is so frustrating, because decision making, even the appointment of the Secretary General, if you've uh, seen that, was, was really complicated. Uh, but at the end of the day, you uh, reach a, a decision and everybody is behind it. And uh, it's not a decision by a group, it's a decision that involves absolutely everybody. And then you have a sound basis on which you, on which, uh, you can proceed. Mm -hmm. Please.
Yes, thank you. Daniel Prince, I'm in the UN Office for Disarmament Affairs. Thank you. And I'd like to take uh, the topic a bit further, what, was just, um, what just came out. You nicely described how the EU and NATO um, have common purposes, which reading the newspapers, you know, nowadays you may <laughs> sort of uh, put a question mark here and there. But I see your point, and of course, OSCE is more like the UN, where very, very different views come together and discuss. Um, so yes, I see that. Um, the context of the Arab, Arab Spring that you uh, very rightly uh, referred to, um, I was wondering how those diverse views in the OSCE may be influenced by this development that we've seen earlier this year in the southern part or to the south of the OSCE, and if you would say that this may even lead to a new sense of common purpose. In other words, is the OEC still mainly looking inwards towards its diverse, diverse views, or will countries within the organization actually see a common purpose of what's happening there to their south? Thank you. Well, this is, this is very much uh, what we're working on now. Uh, to, to verify this. As I said, there's, there's, there's been, uh, there has been in the last 10 years a different mode of the operation uh, of the organization in addressing challenges that affect everybody in, in more or less the same way. And so in developing common policies, common tools, uh, etc. And this is similar in a way. Uh, but it remains to be seen to what extent uh, if, if the OSCE has to assist uh, country X in North Africa, for instance. Uh, we need this country, of course, to be interested and to request for assistance. Uh, and, and that's already a first, uh, a first issue that needs to be verified. We are engaging with them. Uh, there is interesting principle, uh, uh, but then how far are they willing to go? Uh, I think in, in every transition process, uh, national ownership is important. Uh, and, uh, and showing respect for this uh, is equally important from, a, from every external partner. And I think we are, we are doing pretty well on that, uh, on that level. But the second, the second part is, uh, is making sure that the, the constituency uh, is, has the same vision and, and shares uh, the goal. And with the OSC being so broad, obviously you can imagine that there are a number of countries that are very keen uh, to 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 uh, intervene and to do a lot, and others that may be uh, uh, slightly more inclined to look in other directions. Uh, so it's a matter of uh, once again having an agenda that reflects uh, uh, the views of the community as such. It takes into account uh, uh, those of those who see this as a, as an immediate priority, but also takes into account the priorities of others. Let's say take the Central Asian states, who look at another set of challenges and therefore covers both. Uh, because this doesn't mean that you have one excludes the other. And so we need to find also a balance in the overall agenda of the organization as we, as we move forward. That's part of the, of the challenge we have in front of us. Now with IPI, he used to be with the OSC. Um, I was struck by what you were saying because it strikes me that there's quite a paradox. On the one hand, the reason why it's now possible to talk to Mediterranean partners for the first time in 35 years is that they have a willingness to take on some of the OSC commitments. And yet this year is the 20th anniversary of the Moscow document, which said that commitments related to the human dimension, the OSCE, are not the sole prerogative of the, of the state concern, but are the responsibility of all participating states which was revolutionary. It was 15 years ahead of R2P and was the basis for a lot of what the OSC did in the, the following 20 years. But this year, unless I'm mistaken, there's no anniversary of the Moscow document. And I think this is perhaps because some states, including the country where Moscow is, uh, are not so keen on that sentence. So are you perhaps concerned at the same time that the OSC is an inspiration for Mediterranean countries there's the possibility of a little bit of rollback within the organization demonstrated by the fact that there's no anniversary of the Moscow document. Well, I'm not sure how many anniversaries of our documents we have within, uh, within the organization, even though I agree with you that the Moscow, uh, Moscow document was, uh, was certainly a, a very important one. Um, there may be some. There may be some that uh, uh, consider that 
you know, diversifying may detract the attention from, from certain areas. There, there has also been an evolution internally. And uh, uh, what we find, for instance, is that there is more interest in developing uh, uh, an agenda and a cooperation on areas where there is there are clearly joint interests, and uh, and say cyber terrorism now is one of the things on which we start uh, we're starting to to look uh, uh, at at a possible role for the organisation because the membership is is interested in that and the discussion is what can we exactly do we need to map out who is working on these issues uh, what is being done. What can we, how well can we strengthen this within, within the organization, et cetera? Uh, so the, the, these discussions go, go forward more, more easily in a certain way. Uh, and, uh, and when you go back to the, to the Moscow sort of uh, Moscow document approach, uh, um, uh, you, f you find yourself in a political discussion. Uh, 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 as to the extent uh, to which uh, one country is. Uh, and that, uh, that goes back to the dialogue issue that we are saying earlier. Uh, uh, the, the, we, have we have principles, uh, commitments, we have mechanisms to address that, uh, to, uh, and to address the implementation. There is the you know, human dimension implementation meeting in Warsaw. Uh, the one I uh, mentioned earlier will start next week. Uh, we have the dialogue in the Permanent Council, and we have a network of uh, bilateral contacts and other kinds of initiatives uh, where these issues are taken up very seriously, debated in a way that maybe is not as visible, even though sometimes you hear uh, echoes of those discussions in the, in the, in the media. Uh, but, but the fact that the, 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 the document is there, the commitments are there, the principles are there, uh, gives an opportunity for countries who say what is happening in your area is of concern to me, uh, uh, gives a right uh, to the others to have that discussion. Whether you are successful or not, uh, <laughs> that, is, that is another matter. But, uh, but what is important is to have a possibility to uh, have the debate. Well, if I see no more... I think I'm going to wrap it up with a question of my own. Were you about, no, I'm sorry. Oh, very good, please. I thought that probably it's time for someone from this corner to ask could, questions. So could you identify yourself, please? Uh, I'm the Deputy Panel Representative of the Bulgarian Mission. So I wanted to ask a question of more general nature uh, to the Secretary General. Uh, since the topic is the times of transformation, uh, probably it's also uh, already a time uh, to think about upgrades of the role of uh, the OEC sector in general. Uh, and if uh, a dramatic uh, upgrade is not uh, possible, a radical enhancing is not possible, then perhaps some small steps could be, could be taken. And uh, Mr. Kemp mentioned anniversary, but we are going to have an anniversary in, in four years. So perhaps uh, uh, by 2015, perhaps the role of the OECIG could be increased in terms of political influence. And small steps, for example, simple increase of the term of office or following the relationship between the UN Secretary General and the rotating presidency of the Security Council. I mean, these things perhaps could be explored. So, Mr. Secretary General, what, what's, what are your views about it? Um, already in the process of uh, uh, appointment of the Secretary General, the issue of the role of the Secretary General was very much uh, uh, present, and there was debate and the, the debate was about also the, the, uh, the figure and what, what kind of profile uh, uh, should have the, you know, the ideal candidate for the post of the Secretary General. And uh, you, you have seen the results of that, uh, of that discussion. Uh, but what remained uh, is the fact that there was a strong support within the membership for a Secretary General, for a Secretary General that interprets his function uh, in a more political manner. And, uh, and that's what I'm trying to do myself. I, st I started. Uh, I'm, I'm traveling. I have uh, meetings at the political level. 
I travel always with the representative of the chairmanship, so I'm not perceived as, uh, as not being in line uh, with the chairmanship, which gives the political guidance to, to, the, to the organization. But I, I support the chair, uh, and I help the organization having a higher profile and be more present, uh, in a way. Um, one of the problems with the system of chairmanships uh, that we have in the OSC is that you have some chairmanships that are very well equipped, very strong, that don't need much support. And in that case, the Secretary General would necessarily have to step back a bit uh, to, to play more the role of, uh, of the chief administrative officer and then managing the organization and ensuring implementation of the decisions. Uh, but with other chairmanships, there is more space for a, for a more political role. And if, it, if it's interpreted in a transparent way, uh, this seems to me to be perfectly acceptable. Uh, there is another issue that may come up over time, and that is, do we want to keep things the way they are, or do we want to move towards a larger reform? And you can relook uh, over time at the balance between the chairmanship and the, and the secretary general in a structural manner. But uh, yeah, that could be the topic for uh, for a um, uh, uh, big decision in uh, in uh, whenever, uh, for year times so, or further down the line. Uh, but, but I think there is a recognition of a need uh, uh, to have more, also more continuity uh, in, the, in the management of the organization and, uh, and also in the, uh, uh, it's, it's beyond the management, it's the leadership of the organization, making sure that the strategic priori priorities remain there and, the, and, and they don't change with every, uh, with every chairmanship. So a stronger secretary general is also a guarantee of continuity in the work of the organization. And I think it's also the principles also supported by many because of that. Please. Thank you very much. Uh, Rizul Shainal from uh, Turkish Mission Legal Counselor. First of all, I would like to extend my uh, warm welcome to Secretary General here for the first time in his capacity as the Secretary General, I suppose. We would like to see him more often here and to develop the cooperation between OSC and the UN. I think it's, it's, it's important. As to my question, uh, I wonder how OSC is adapting itself to the new security challenges, specifically uh, if I have to mention one, that's the terrorism. You have also mentioned in your uh, presentation as well. Uh, do you think that OSC is uh, efficiently dealing with this issue in, in his, his area? Thank you. The issue of terrorism, you mean? Yeah. Well, well I, I would say about 10 years ago, the OSC has created a, a unit in its fold uh, dealing with, uh, uh, with anti-terrorism issues. Uh, um, the, uh, uh, I think the, the starting point uh, uh, for the OSC has been uh, um, uh, looking at the UN, at the UN conventions, and the ability of its uh, member states to uh, uh, implement them. So assisting them in uh, passing legislation, adapting the legislation to reflect the contents of the conventions, and then developing the tools to, uh, to implement them. And there is obviously, there was a very uh, uh, different uh, situation across uh, the, the membership of the organization. This led to a number of projects uh, 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 that were um, uh, directed towards the weaker uh, countries in a way it's, it's uh, the usual principle, a chain is as strong as its weakest link. So really strengthening the weaker links in the chain and, and making sure that the organization is really... And this is an area where I, I think the interaction with the, with the UN continues to, be, uh, continues to be very close. Now the agenda is expanding and as I said now there are issues like cybersecurity that are now coming up and we need to, uh, to look into. Um, uh, what I'm doing and what I'm doing actually in this budget is something that I, I'm going back to Vienna to uh, uh, announce more formally and I hope I will get the support uh, from the participating states. I'm also restructuring the secretariat now to uh, be able to deal more efficiently uh, with, uh, uh, with some of these uh, uh, issues uh, that uh, we 
put under the, the, the uh, heading of, uh, of transnational uh, threats. Uh, and uh, we, we have a number of units in the, the Secretariat that deal with policing and strengthening police forces, uh, this anti-terrorism uh, unit. Uh, we have a unit that deals with borders, border management and security, and we cluster them together so that uh, we look at the various challenges and the various problems we have from different perspectives, and we operate in parallel and in an integrated manner uh, to, uh, to provide more efficient assistance to, uh, to member states. So that's part of a reform I'm already proposing in the context of, uh, of the budget, and we'll have to see how, how member states react to that. Uh, seeing no more hands, I have a final question of my own, and uh, Secretary General, it's, it's pretty much a conversational question, and it's more about the UN than it is about the OSCE, uh, and it arises out of a personal experience. The personal experience was I was asked this morning to give an interview on WNYC, which happens to be the station I listen to all day. It's the public radio station um, in New York. And since I spent most of my life asking other people for interviews, I can't very well say no. Uh, and after I said yes, they then told me who my interviewer would be. My interviewer was Andy Borowitz, who some of you may know is America's most successful political satirist. And those of you who live in this city or this country in particular know how very easy it is for Americans to make fun of the United Nations. So I don't know what I got into. I don't know if I survived. If I did survive, we'll probably put it on the website. If you don't see it on the website, I didn't survive. But here's the question I want to ask you, and it is really conversational. One of the arguments I made about the value of this week was it isn't the theatrics of a, of a Chavez or a Gaddafi or indeed an Obama appearing and making a speech. Um, it's much more what goes on on the sidelines, behind the scenes. And I made the point that for diplomats and for UN officials in particular, uh, they are able to see 20, 25, 30 people from that many countries um, in, in informal settings in which they can get quite a bit of work done and it also spares them making 20, 25, or 30 trips to other capitals. Am I right about that? And I want to ask you, how has it been for you here this week? Have you accomplished things? Have you bumped into people you otherwise would not have seen? By all means. That was the, the key reason for me to be here. Okay. And uh, yeah, I had, uh, so far I'm looking of, good. Uh, so far I'm looking good. No, no, no. And uh, I had meetings with, say, the Secretary General of the, the OIC, the, the Organization of Islamic Conference. Uh, I had meetings with a number of foreign ministers from our own member states. Uh, and uh, um, to give an example, uh, we had a problem with one of uh, one of our member states because to implement a project we needed some initiative, some action from the government. I met with the minister, he said, I fully understand. The following day, they called me from Vienna, they said, it's signed, we are moving. Uh, so it, it, it is, for me, easy also to, uh, having everybody here, uh, to, to talk to, to, uh, to people in a, in a way that uh, allows us to, uh, to make progress quickly. But also, it's, uh, it is important for me to uh, uh, um, uh, check uh, uh, what is the temperature on some of the strategic issues having a bit of a brainstorming uh, uh, with, uh, uh, with the ministers or other uh, key interlocutors uh, on some of the issues we're discussing now to see how they view them. Uh, how they, and it's, it brings me out of, uh, of the Vienna setup where I more or less know what everybody says, but I, I find a different flat platform also for me to launch certain messages and then to see if they take root and, uh, and uh, uh, give also my, my sense, my perception of, uh, of uh, where things are. So I think it's important. And uh, it's certainly uh, um, for me, and it's important also as an opportunity to uh, uh, um, uh, raise the profile, of course, of the organization. It's been very valuable for us to have you here. It seems to me from what you just said, you'll be back here again next year. And if you come back here next, next year, please come back to IPI. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.